Hey everybody, it's Gomladex, and welcome back to some more Magic Arena. Today we're going to be playing another Chromatic Cube Draft, and we have one of the best cards in the entire cube as our pack one pick one, Lutri, the Spell Chaser. This is a card that gets to go into your deck in the companion slot for free in cube, because the companion requirement is just that every card in your deck has a different name, which is already going to happen in any cube draft. It's a singleton format, so... An easy pack one pick one here, even if it isn't as powerful as the other cards when it's individually cast, we have access to it in every single game of Magic. So even if it only helps us out a little bit, it'll help us out in every single game instead of being a card like anything else where we have to have drawn it um, at random out of all the other cards. So essentially lets us start with an eight card hand, so easy Lutri the Spell Chaser here. Completely ridiculous card, and it also happens to be quite a powerful one if you do draft around it, which isn't even required, but if you do draft around this card, you can double up some really big instants and sorceries. There's some very major ones in the cube. So we'll start with the loot tree here and, uh, and get maybe some kind of blue-red spells deck going, but again, don't have to draft around it that, that harshly here. We can just take that and get value from it just being in the companion slot. Pick two, we've got a Sky Sovereign, which is kind of nice. Whatever colors we end up playing, we can slam this into the deck, and it should be pretty good. Dealing three damage or something on Enter the Battlefield, and three additional damage every time it attacks. Not super hard to crew. I like the Dryad a lot. It's really good mana fixing. Makes all of your lands just every color of mana. Zakama is a very fun card to try to ramp into. You get a 9-mana nine 9-9. Nine nine. But when you cast it, you untap all of your lands. So you have to get nine lands on board. But if you do, this is essentially a free 9-9 nine, nine Vigilance Reach and Trample. And then you can use that extra mana you just got to blow up some creatures, some enchantments, gain some life. Zakama's a really cool card. Won a lot of games of Momir with Zakama's. Yeah, personally for me here, I'm just going to roll with a Zakama here, just because it's a cool card that I personally enjoy. A lot of my picks in cube are going to be along that kind of uh, logic, because it is pretty much just a for-fun draft format. Pick three, we have Nicol Bolas God Pharaoh. If you know anything about uh, my favorite characters in Lilith, Nicol Bolas is my number one favorite Magic the Gathering character, my number one favorite Planeswalker Incredibly, incredibly cool card, incredibly cool character. Every Bolas Planeswalker is super powerful and exactly the kind of just explosive stuff to ramp into that I love playing, so it's going to be really hard for me to pass a Nicol Bolas in any format, so I'll take that here. There's also a Holebreaker Horror here, which does show off that it is the alchemy version of this card. One thing to worry about, if there's any card in this format that's been rebalanced in alchemy, it's going to be the alchemy rebalanced version. I got hit pretty hard by this in my last draft, I drafted a Meat Hook Massacre really highly because during the draft it showed off that it was a regular Meat Hook Massacre, but then when I got into the gameplay, it was the rebalanced version. So Arena literally didn't tell me that I was drafting a nerfed version of that card. So if you have the meta knowledge of knowing what cards have been nerfed in Alchemy, pretty good knowledge to have in this format because sometimes it just straight doesn't tell you for some reason. So, uh... I can tell you that one for sure, at least. The Meat Hook Massacre is the nerfed version. You will not be gaining life from the Meat Hook Massacre if you cast that during the gameplay, even though it tells you during the draft that you will. So that's a pretty big bummer. That was uh, pretty frustrating in my last draft. I did look back on it, and it 100% said it was the un uh, nerfed version during the draft process. So do keep that in mind. I was just reminded of that when I saw the Holebreaker Horror. Um, so we could take some cheap interaction here to blow up some early aggressive plays from other players. I like Cut Turbans um, particularly well for this kind of thing. Maybe move into a Grixis Spells deck. That seems like a great place to put Nicol Bolas. So yeah, let's make sure we're not dying to any quick aggressive decks. Get a nice cheap piece of removal. That also gives us uh, some extra damage late game. If we go Grixis here, blue, black, red. Pick five. I like Dream Meter a lot. Good piece of interaction, bouncing any non-land permanent back to its owner's hand at instant speed while putting a 4-3 flyer onto the board and setting up your future draws by surveilling for letting you look through the top four, put them back in any order and any of them into your graveyard. So Dream Meter is a super sweet card. Definitely looking to go like Grixis Control here. I really want to make this Nicol Bolas work 
Again, as always, in Cube Draft, there are plenty of super strong cards here that we could be taking in slightly different strategies like Runus Ultimatum, Tireless Tracker, and Tulsimir, great for uh, for green decks. Mystic's probably pretty sweet as well, ramping up. But uh, I'm going to try to get this Nicobolas to happen because I really, really like Nicobolas. Kologon's Command is another very good, efficient little piece of removal interaction. It's a very flexible one as well. Gets to deal two to any target and destroy an artifact, or just make somebody discard a card or return a card from grave to hand. So any two of those options, a lot of these options are really good. I am passing up on some great mana fixing here, which is something you generally don't want to do, especially if you're trying to go five colors, but I think I'm trying to really zone in on just Grixis here if I can, and Kologon's Command is such a good piece of interaction, I am going to take it over. Fabled Passage is probably the best mana fixing there. Okay, no blue, black, red lands here, which is really unfortunate because this is a pack where I would very easily just pick the land, and I probably still will because none of these non-land cards are super explosively powerful. They're all very good roll, roll fillers or synergy pieces for different strategies, um, but this is where I'd be super happy to take a land, but there is no land Take a Palladium Mirror, it does theoretically ramp into a 7 mana Planeswalker like Nicol Bolas if it doesn't get blown up. There's a decent amount of cheap interaction in this cube though, like Kologon's Command and Cut that can blow up your mirror, and then you're pretty unhappy with it. Eh, I'll still just take it here, I don't think I'm running the spell fee for the Jaxus or anything like that. Pick 8, Blood Mage is pretty flexible. Stop any graveyard recursion with that exile effect, or you can draw a card, or if your opponent's really aggressive, you can just get a couple blockers off of it, make it a 2-1, and get a 1-1 pest. Pretty good. If we're aggressive, we could go for Lelia the Blade Reforged, but I'm likely to be more controlling with a big late-game win condition like Nico Bolas, and a deck that's going to want to play a lot of big instants and sorceries, because we have Lutri as well. So I'm going to go Callous Blood Mage here. Again, Lelia much better for a more aggressive deck, but... I don't think I'm getting super aggro. Vizier of Tumbling Sands is another potential mana dork. It puts you up one mana because you can untap your lands with this thing. And it's a little bit more flexible because you can untap creatures and stuff. It's not the greatest deal ever. There are some two mana mana rocks in this cube, and those are perfect at three mana mana ramp. It's a little less exciting, but still the best card in this pack for us. I'm not going to try to cast a Dracozeth or a Fiery Emancipation. Triple Red's kind of a hard sell especially when I haven't taken a single dual land yet. So here's another three mana mana rock again. Pretty mediocre. Sky Sovereign there, but I don't think I'm going to have a super high creature count for crewing that easily. Especially because multiple of my creatures have two power or one power right now, and this requires a crew of three. I'm really not high on the three mana mana rocks, so I'm going to take the Illyrios as just a very good uh, blocker over the three mana mana rock, the letter of acceptance there. Leyline Binding is excellent in five color decks in this cube. It's just one mana interaction, but Sphinx of Clear Skies, Multiple Choice, and Dragon Master Outcast, all great for this Grixis strategy. I'm going to go for the Instant or Sorcery here, try to keep this count high. Multiple choice is really good for five mana. You get a four four, scry one, draw a card, and make your opponent bounce a card. Play with fire for cheap interaction. Escape to the Wilds would be a good splash. This is a very good card. You're drawing five cards for five mana, which is pretty ridiculous. Sure, you can only play those cards for a turn or two, but it's still nuts. Um, everything here is going to be pretty much impossible for us to cast, so I might as well dream big and take a ruinous ultimatum. All right, random nonsense to finish that off, but pack two, pick one, we open up an excellent addition to this deck. Kind of like a second copy of Nicol Bolas God Pharaoh, it's Tybalt, Cosmic Imposter, another pretty unbeatable seven mana Planeswalker. With this one, we spend seven to get a five loyalty Planeswalker out. We can minus three this Tybalt to exile our opponent's biggest threat, their biggest creature. And then with Tybalt's emblem, we get to cast their own cards that we're exiling against them. Pretty nuts card that completely flips the game in the other direction, so we're definitely taking Tybalt. This card is absurd. 
If Tybalt weren't in here, Solemn Simulacrum would be a great addition. This helps us get to our big six mana, seven mana ways to end the game. Um, but Tybalt, I'm just going to take another ridiculous game ending card here. A lot of three mana stuff going on right now. Looking for a couple more little cheap pieces of interaction, like play with fire and cut, ideally. Or some cheap uh, mana rocks, like a cold steel heart. That's a two mana way to get some extra mana. That would be beautiful. A little more at four and five as well. So let's see. Shark Typhoon is a lovely, lovely card. Very flexible one. The worst this card is, is three mana for a 1-1 one, one flyer and you draw a card at instant speed. That's the absolute worst deal you're getting. And for every extra man you dump into it, you're getting a one extra power and toughness on that shark, which is really, really good. Um, you can also just hard cast the enchantment side of this if you have multiple other spells to cast later in the game. And then you're just going to keep getting massive sharks throughout. Shark Typhoon is completely nuts, as are most of the cards in this pack, as you can tell in cube. I'm probably supposed to take Dragon Skull Summit here. Um, I'll just go with a... Three color deck with absolutely no mana fixing and see how poorly that works for me. That, that'll be interesting today. Do the exact opposite of what I did the first time. The first time I drafted uh, a five color deck with basically, I had 17 non-basic lands, but I cut one or two of them and put some basics in. So I'm going to take the Shark Typhoon here. Now we have an Urtai Resurrected, which is great instant speed interaction. Crackle with Power is a great sorcery to duplicate. With Lutri the Spell Chaser. Cavalier of Night is potentially a removal spell on a stick. Sciator's Proven Ground is a red black dual land, and I do have 15 great cards in the deck so far, and I think the best addition right now is like Urtai or Crackle with Power. Neither of which I think are quite as good and consistent as Shark Typhoon and some of the other stuff I've been taking, because those are just more flexible, better and more situations. I'm going to actually take the red-black dual land here. Uh, I will take a magma opus now though, because that's another beautiful Lutri the Spell Chaser combo. Huge instant flips the game around, dealing fours, divided as you choose among any number of permanents, tapping two permanents, creating a 4-4, and drawing two cards. Really ridiculous deal. Roll with that. And there's no mana fixing in this pack to take over it anyway. It's like Discovery Dispersal is the more flexible, cheap card. That would be the very, very safe pick that I could cast in a lot of games, but Magma Opus is the strongest card for this deck. No red-green dual land. If this were blue, black, or red, I'd scoop it up. I don't think Pyromancer is that great, even in a dedicated instant sorcery deck. We're not that dedicated. Jonathan Harker's pretty fun when you've got a lot of 7, 8 mana stuff in your deck. Eventually you get to flip this thing into casting them for free, and in the meantime, it's basically a merfolk looter. Draw a card, discard a card every turn. Not horrible. It's slow and everything, but there's not really anything to take over it. Kaito is not good because we're not getting in combat a lot. Pyromancer always feels a little slow. A little inconsistent. I'm just going to go for Jacob Hawken. Uh, looks like pretty much nothing in here. It's a Hedron Archive. We're much more interested in mana rocks that could provide colored mana. Lolth is probably pretty good, though. For five mana, you get two two ones with Menace in Reach. At the minimum, and then you can start drawing a card, losing life every turn if your opponent doesn't kill Lolth. That's... Pretty fine. My children drench their hands in the blood of my enemies. Got another red, red black dual land here. Gonna have to take it over a Gonti. Only huge card competing. Smoldering Egg is good with a lot of instant sorceries. We have five right now though. Yeah, it's kind of Gonti versus Savai Triome. Hopefully I can get my uh I can get my stealing my opponent's card dream done with Bolas and Tybalt, because both of those do the same thing. I can cast my opponent's spells against them. So I can uh, I can complete that with those two cards, hopefully. Ornithopter of Paradise. Let's go. There's a two-mana mana rock. 
It is a creature though, so it can sh it can get shot by cheap interaction, which would be bad for sure. And there's also cheap interaction, Royal Eruption. That's actually a really difficult choice. Royal Eruption versus Ornithopter Paradise. Cheap mana fixing and mana ramp, or cheap interaction to stop your opponent's cheap mana fixing mana ramp. I'm gonna go for the Ornithopter here. I'm just gonna cross my fingers and hope my opponents aren't drafting the cheap interaction as highly as I am, and this little Ornithopter can put in a lot of work to helping us get to these big spells early. That red-white duel is not good for us. We're just taking a braid. All about that cheap interaction. And we wield the Dragon Skull Summit. Let's go. niv it. Very powerful card. Also very hard to cast. Every single land that we need on board has to be blue or red. So if we have any natural swamps on board, it's going to take until we have seven or eight lands on board to cast this thing. Be really, really difficult. Siphon Insight's a decent little card draw. Get to draw cards out of your opponent's library, which is fun. But I'm taking the mana fixing there. Um, opportunistic Dragon sometimes is just randomly really good when your opponent has a good human down. Worst case scenario, it's a 4-mana four 4-3 four, flyer, which isn't horrible. We're not going to be a creature-heavy deck for Bone Shards or Immersturm Predator. Both of those want to sacrifice our own creatures for value, and I don't think our deck will be very good at doing that. 4-mana for a Planeswalker that just we draw a Shivan Dragon every turn is absolutely hilarious. I don't know how good it is. Maybe Discovery Dispersal is better, but in the glory of dragons. this is pretty funny. I'm, I'm into just throwing a bunch of Shivan Dragons in my hand. Why not? Um, this is the only castable card, but I'm not going to play it. Because it's an equipment. Yeah, need a bunch of creatures for it. All right, last pick Smoldering Egg. I don't think that'll make the cut in our deck, but it is possible. And unfortunately, our final pack is not mega exciting. Probably going to take Ugin, the Ineffable, Eugene over here. It's a pretty powerful Planeswalker, and it's completely colorless, so there's no possible way that this card will wheel. The minus three ability can destroy pretty much any problem on the board, and the plus one just consistently spits out a bunch of two twos to help protect Eugene and also draw us cards. Very, very good card for literally anybody's deck, so this is the least likely card in the whole pack to wheel. And then I'm hoping to wheel a red-black duel again, because I think it's more likely than the other cards based on what happened last pack. And then if that doesn't wheel, maybe we get the Enthusiasm for cheap interaction or a Rankle or something, which is all fine. Into being long before your kind ever existed. Okay, Ral's Outburst is pretty good interaction as well, but we already have a loaded deck. Right, we have 25 non-land cards already, which means every single non-land pick is just going to be making the deck a little better. It's going to be narrowing out a card like Goro Goro that doesn't do anything for us to put a card like Ral's Outburst that's good interaction in for us. So we're not like desperately seeking more non-land cards right now. We can have an okay deck if I take nothing but lands from this point on. So I think every opportunity that I have to take lands, unless the card is really good like Eugene... I'm going to take the land, so I'm going to take the Blood Crypt here, taking it over like Ral's Outburst. Shia seems a little slow to me, Allrind's a little slow. Um, Siege Gang, Champion are good for like other kinds of decks. I don't think they're all great for this one, though. I'm going to take the Blood Crypt. Now I take a Shipwreck Marsh. Obnix, this is very powerful, but we don't have the Sack Fodder to double up for the Casualty, which is where it is super powerful. Prosper's really, really good, though. Draw an extra card every single turn that this stays on the board, and we get treasure tokens every time we cast one of the cards that we exile with this. Prosper's on that borderline of taking that over a Shipwreck Marsh. But again, I think I have a lot of good win conditions. Our win conditions are just trying to get a Planeswalker on board, have one of our Planeswalkers sit around long enough to win. Sarkin, or Lolth, or Eugene, or Nicol Bolas, or Tybalt. I have a lot of ways to end the game. Let's just make sure our mana's great. Take the Shipwreck Marsh. There was also a, a Vessel of the Fire Mine. That actually might have been better there. Didn't really notice that till I clicked the uh, clicked the Submit button, the Confirm Pick button. But that would be a good addition to this deck as well. Um, it doesn't look like there's much for us. Sap Vitality is pretty difficult. I have to hit Double Black. Aether Channeler is pretty flexible. Interaction, that's got to be good. Shatter Skull Smashing replaces a Mountain in the deck with a card that we could top deck late game as removal. 
So that's pretty good. Shadow Skull Smashing or Aether Channeler seem great. Go for the Aether Channeler. Mm, blue Black Duel. Expansion Explosion's pretty good, but it is a lot of mana. The ideal with this card is you get up to like 8 mana, which is again a lot of mana it's going to take till way late in the game, but then you go 8 mana, you blow up their 4 toughness card and draw 4 cards. Nightclub Bouncer is pretty efficient. Instant speed, bounce an opposing card, make it cost more. Some good stuff in the pack, but pretty easy for us to take lands since we have more than enough non-lands right now. Now we have a Watery Grave versus a Pathway. I tend to slightly prefer the um, dual lands to the pathways, but I prefer pathways over guaranteed comes into play tapped lands, like temples. So the fact that the pathways come into play untapped is pretty nice, but the fact that um, the shock lands can provide blue or black, so it provides like a different color of mana each turn whenever we need it, makes it a little better than a pathway in my opinion. Because, of course, if we need the shock land into play untapped, we can always get it in untapped as well. Just costs us a couple life. So there's no mana fixing for us in here, but there's also not really anything. There's a 5 mana 6-6. Six, six. That's about it. 5 mana 6-6 six, six, trample, no abilities. 4 mana for a clone. I don't think we're playing any of this, but maybe we run a random 5 mana 6-6 six, six with trample. Question mark? Unsure? Unclear? This card is a really fun alchemy card again. You conjure up an XX version of a random card from your opponent's deck onto the battlefield. Sometimes it's great, sometimes it's horrible. Fun card. Nightmare Shepherd more consistently good, but again, we still don't have that many creatures. Probably supposed to just take a temple. I'm just going to grab a blue-red temple. Okay, we didn't wheel the black-red dual land, so pretty happy I just scooped up a million lands outside of that this pack. Looks like the reason we weren't getting many lands early is because like all the blue black red lands just showed up in pack three, which is weird, but it happens. I'll take a wrinkle here. Wrinkle's a nice card because you can always choose the abilities on wrinkle that benefit you the most in whatever position you're in. Sometimes that'll be making everybody sack a creature. Sometimes that'll be drawing a card. Sometimes that'll be everybody discarding a card. I think I'm doing good enough on lands to pass up on a canyon slew and take a rouse outburst now. Very nice instant speed interaction plus card draw. I wouldn't pass up on another land that could come into play untapped, but the Canyon Slew is another one of these dual lands that always comes into play tapped, so it doesn't feel great. And uh, yeah, we're just wheeling everything that I wanted to take over the lands anyway, so feels like a great place to be. We'll grab a Prosper Tome bound. And now we can take that Shatter Skull Smashing. And the Expansion Explosion. Okay, we very much have a deck here. Every single card that we were considering, we pretty much got this pack. Uh, Agnes is actually castable for us. Forgot about the amount of hybrid mana in that. We could spend double red, black, and one to cast that. So it is not an insta-cut. Um, and I guess I might as well put everything in here so I can explain all of the cuts. But those two that I just put in are definitely going to get removed. So we need to cut 12 cards out of this deck to get to a um, 23 non-land card. Approximately 18 land deck because we can count Shatter Skull Smashing. Play that as Shatter Skull to Hammer Pass quite often unless we're flooding out. And I think 18 lands is where a lot of decks in this format want to be. And this deck is no, is no different. We have massive X mana spells. We have 8 mana spells. 7 mana spells, 6 mana spells. We definitely want to up our land count a little bit above the average, go up to 18 here. So first of all, we only need to cut 11 cards because our first pick was Lutri the Spell Chaser, which goes into the command zone, basically. It goes in the companion slot. So we only need to cut 11 cards, not 12. Um, let's start at the biggest stuff and then lower down. I like all of our big high mana cards. Ilharg doesn't do anything to synergize with our deck. It's just a 5 mana 6-6 six, six trample, which is a big beefy creature that can attempt to close out the game by itself, but there's decent interaction in this cube to just blow up a single 6-6 six, six that doesn't give you any value, so it's not going to be great. Plus, we have plenty of ways to win the game, mostly Planeswalkers, 
Ilhard does not feel like it makes the cut. Lolth also seems like the worst planeswalker in our deck, because I am going to be trying to probably lower down the creature to the creature count quite a bit, so the ability to get additional loyalty counters on Lolth isn't going to happen too often. Lolth is still 5 mana, 2-2, two, two, 1 spiders, and then draw some cards maybe, but uh, I'm going to put Lolth in the maybes pile. Definitely the weakest of all of our planeswalkers. Again, Eugene, Nico Bolas, and uh, Tybalt all... Just absolutely incredible planeswalkers in comparison. Um, then I think Sarkin's even probably better. Like with Lulth, we get to draw a card, lose a life every turn. With Sarkin, Sarkin is a one mana cheaper than Lulth. Sarkin can be used as interaction, dealing three damage to an opposing creature. And Sarkin kind of does the same thing. Instead of losing a life and drawing a card, we are just straight up drawing a Shivan Dragon every turn <laughs> without losing a life, so... That's just, I don't know, it's, that's so much more fun than Lulth. <laughs> and the fact that it's one mana less and it's interaction, I'm, I'm just going to go ahead and cut Lulth right now. Um, again, I don't know if it's strictly better, but it feels a little better to me, and it's definitely more fun, more more cool to just throw a bunch of Shivan Dragons in hand. Uh, Rankle's a very flexible card, I'm into it, we'll go for it. Um, Jaxus is less so. Jaxus, sometimes you'll have a perfect synergy out with this card, but if you ever draw this card and it's your only creature on board, it is pretty horrific. I guess that's what the Blitz backup plan is. You can Blitz it and then draw another card, but yeah, never been all that impressed by Jaxus, especially since it's in the cube that also has the reflection of Kiki Jiki in it. That's just a way better version of Jaxus. If you really care about duplicating your own creatures, just uh, draft Reflection of Kiki Jiki super highly. And now we have Opportunistic Dragon. It's very opportunistic. It's uh, definitely depends on the matchup, depends what your opponent is playing. Again, if you steal anything with this, if they have any human on the board or any good artifact on the board, this card's going to be pretty nuts. The problem is... That's not going to happen in every game. That's not even going to happen in the majority of games. It's going to happen maybe one out of five or something like that. Um, and in those others games, it's not going to quite pull its weight. A four mana four three flyer is fine, but definitely not like cube worthy power level. So that is a potential cut. Agnes is almost definitely a cut. I like getting treasure tokens as much as the next guy, but this is the chromatic cube. Our plays and our creatures are going to become absolutely massive. Being able to attack with this repeatedly is kind of a hard sell. It's very easy to get something bigger than a 3-3 on the board. And uh, we are only going to have this as like our only haste creature. So this is the only thing making a treasure. So it just makes one treasure every turn maximum. And that's if we can get through with a 3-3 without it getting blocked. So Agnes feels like just a straight cut. Not even uh, just a maybe like the dragon. Packed weapon here. I mean, it's cool. It's funny. I've played my fair share of packed weapons back in Baldur's Gate Limited. I don't think I'm going to play around with it here in Cube. It's a little bit too much of a glass cannon where you're putting a lot of resources into your one creature because you have to discard a card to equip. So the way that you really get blown out is when you discard a card Say, I'm going to equip this to my opportunistic dragon now, and then your opponent goes like, okay, lightning bolt, and then your dragon dies, and you still discarded a card for absolutely nothing, so it's pretty hefty equip costs. Again, it's for a huge ability, you know, you can't lose the game and you're drawing extra cards, but still a little, little glass cannony for me here, we'll cut that out. Love the interaction, going to keep the Ral's Outburst and the cut to ribbons, and cut to ribbons is a two drop, not a four drop, don't know why it ended up over there. Moving on to three mana, Aether Channeler is pretty flexible, helps defend ourselves with two creatures when we need it, helps just mess with our opponent's tempo, bouncing their own card when we need it, just draws us a card when we're looking for more gas. Um, I might cut um, a couple of these slower mana dork style cards like Palladium Mirror and Vizier of Tumbling Sands. Because another big way you can try to hit your high mana value plays is just by playing a bunch of cheap interaction to stay alive throughout the early game. Still feel like I want some amount of mana ramp, though. I have got a lot of big high mana stuff, so maybe not. Um, Callous Blood Mage is basically the black version of Aether Channeler. 
Another very flexible enter the battlefield effect, which is cool and powerful. Keep that. Illyrios and Cemetery Limiter probably. They're, they're definitely also potentially cuts. Yeah, with the Illuminator, we have to get something engraved before this gives us any extra value outside of being a 3-mana 2-3. Two, and even when we do, our card types are kind of all over the place. We're not going to have a massively high creature count, nor will we have a massively high instant sorcery or planeswalker count. Instant maybe we'll have the most of at 6. And then creatures, we're definitely cutting down below 15. So I don't think this is actually going to draw us too many extra cards. So I'm going to go ahead and cut Illuminator here and Illyrios. Illyrios feels like probably just a worse version of the Aether Channeler and Callous Blood Mage because they both chump block really well like Illyrios does where they come into play with an additional creature as well. They don't trade as often because they have less power, but I think the flexibility makes them more valuable. So I'll cut Illyrios there. Um, going to two mana, Goro Goro does just about nothing in here. Um, we have very few modified creatures, if any. We might have one that I'm missing, but I don't see one in, in the deck. Um, yeah, so it's just a two mana 2-2 two, two that can give our stuff haste. Not really worth it. Jonathan Harker, Harker's Obsessive Inquiry, a little slow. Very cool cards. Smoldering Egg, another very cool card that might be a bit too slow as well. We have nine instants and sorceries. We need to cast a total mana value of seven or more off of our instants and sorceries for this to flip. Might be a little difficult to do. I'm going to put it in the maybe. In the maybe zone. Uh, so I already looked at the big non-creatures. Um... Kologon's Command, super efficient, super good. Cut to Ribbons, super efficient, super good. Mask of Immolation doesn't really make sense in here. It just, it was like the last pick in some pack. Yep, this pretty much can get insta-cut. I guess it synergizes with Callous Blood Mage and Aether Channeler because they both put a token into play, but not that well. So we still have to spend two mana to equip this every time we want to sack something to do one to something, so we'll cut that. Definitely keeping multiple choice in and play with fire. So we need to cut two more cards, and those two cards are going to be our choice out of all of these. I think I'm going to go ahead and keep the Mana Ramp in, keep the Vizier of Tumbling Sands and the Palladium Mirror, try to cast some early losses. Sounds like a good time to me. Two more cuts to go. That means we get to pick one of these cards to keep in the deck. I think I'm going to keep one of the two drops. I think I'm dropping the Opportunistic Dragon in favor of another early game play. Really like the idea of having Jonathan Harker to set up our draws. We get to draw a card, exile a card face down. This is gonna be really, really helpful when we have hands where we need to get to like seven mana, because we get to use this to draw a card, exile a card, then we just exile some non-land card to help dig towards those lands so we can keep hitting a land drop every single turn. And if our opponent never blows up the Jonathan Harker, then we get to flip it later and cast everything we exiled under it. And even if they do blow up the Jonathan Harker, it still did its job hitting lands when we need them or hitting non-lands when we need them and just exiling whichever card type we didn't need at the time. So I like setting up my draws a lot. I'm just into cards like Jonathan Harker. So we'll cut those two. And this will be our deck. Going to be a Grixis control deck focused on some big Planeswalker win conditions. Forgot to mention one of the most important aspects of building your cube decks, especially in the chromatic cube, is the mana base. So let's go ahead and check how much we have of each color. 10 blue cards, 11 red cards, and 7 black. So it sounds like we want pretty equal red and blue sources and a little bit less black sources. Hopefully we picked enough dual lands here that the mana looks really good for us, but we will find out. So let's sort by red and blue first. And it's looking like we should have a million of each source and uh, and really be well set up in terms of mana. So your average draft deck outside of a cube format ends up being like nine sources of one color and eight of the other. If it's just all basic lands, you know, like nine swamps and then eight mountains if you're black red, something like that. So if we get to where all three of our colors are around seven or eight sources, that's like just as good as if our deck was entirely basics in a two color deck, which is really where you want to be. That's just beautiful. So let's see, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Wait, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Yeah, ten red sources. Excellent, beautiful for blue. 
we have five, six, seven, eight blue sources. Yeah, so ten, eight, and then for black sources, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So we have 10, 8, and 8 as the split here, which is really, really good. I'm probably going to go 9, 9, 8 here, cut a mountain, add an island. That seems pretty reasonable to me. I suppose we do have more early game red cards than blue cards. Our blue cards kind of hit later on on the curve. So this is actually pretty good the way they have it set up here. Yeah, because we do really want play with fire, abrade, and cut to be available turn 1, turn 2 every time. Yeah, I mean, 1088 seems perfectly reasonable as well. Perfectly reasonable. Yep, yeah, 998 or 1088 it's going to be, and I'm just going to go with 1088. We don't need double blue until, like, turn 6, so 8 blue sources should be more than enough, and I don't really want to cut down on black sources because we do have a couple pretty good double black cards, particularly Rankle at 4 mana. We want that double black for, so yeah, we'll go for it. 10 mountains or 10 red sources, 8 blue sources, 8 black sources, all thanks to having a lot of non-basics in this deck. Our mana base should be perfect. All right, here we have a look at the deck that we will be playing today. It's going to be a Grixis control deck here. We're trying to have a good amount of cheap interaction and card draw to stay alive throughout the early game. Spells like Play With Fire, Abraid, Cuts, Kologon's Command to interact with our opponent's early threats, maybe keep them off of mana by blowing up their mana dorks or their mana rocks with the ability to destroy artifacts off Kologon's Command and Abraid. So slow our opponents down with that kind of stuff. And sit here drawing cards, setting up our own hands with Jonathan Harker, being able to set up our hands, drawing and discarding. Aether Channeler and Callous Blood Mage both have an enter the battlefield draw a card effect. And then three little mana dorks here, a Palladium Mirror for double colorless, Vizier for another mana of whatever our lands can produce, and Ornithopter of Paradise for one mana of any color to help hit our late game plays. Our big win conditions here that we're trying to win the game with after slowing our opponents down, keeping them off of their big plays is uh, a bunch of really powerful Planeswalkers, primarily Nico Bolas God Pharaoh. This is the card that really got me pushing towards a Grixis control deck because if I, if I ever get past the Nicol Bolas God Pharaoh, I'm going to try super hard to play it because it's my favorite character, and that's kind of the big piece of this deck, Nicol Bolas God Pharaoh. So, Nico Bolas, Ugin the Ineffable, Tybalt Cosmic Imposter, and to a lesser extent, Sarkin Wanderer to Shiv are our Planeswalker win conditions. But we also have some pretty massive spells that can change the course of the game, like Explosion and Magma Opus. And uh, just some good little uh, value creatures in the way, like Wrinkle and Prosper, stuff like that. Another thing I forgot to mention that I will before we get into the gameplay is that we did pack one, pick one, a Lutri, the Spell Chaser, because this is a card that you get to play in your companion slot without having to draft around it at all. We drafted around it a tiny bit. We do have some big instants and sorceries we could potentially duplicate if we have the mana early on to get the loot tree into our hand. Maybe later game if we have a ton of mana we can double up a magma opus or something, but we'll see how well the loot tree plays. The one thing that I know for sure is that it's going to be just a free eighth card in hand every game, which is pretty sick. So yeah, very excited about this deck and we'll see how it does as we head into the gameplay. All right, so here we are, game one, with a three land hand, thanks to Shatter Skull Smashing, so we can cast everything in hand, and we have all of our colors. Well, we can't cast everything in hand. We have to draw another land off Channeler, but we have multiple draw steps to do it. So I'm just going to go for it here. Highly likely we'll need to play this as a land, so I'm just going to go ahead and do that right now. Get the tapped lands out of the way, turn one and turn two. I really don't like this UI update. It used to say, like, pay to life or decline, and now it's just decline, take action. I might be going crazy, but I really feel like it used to say uh, pay to life or enter tapped or something like that. Preferred that as the UI. I feel like I have to think more this way. Um, do I want to keep my opponent off their extra mana here? And if I do, which way do I want to do that? I want to kill the druid forever? Do I want to just put it in their hand? I think it's probably good to slow my opponent down a little bit here. I'm going to put it in their hand here. Get 
This way I get to commit some stuff to the board while keeping them off of their extra mana. And because Kologon's Command's additional effects, the best one we have right now is making them discard a card, and making them discard a card when they have like six in hand, not actually that valuable, so not getting that much help with the Kologon's Command there. Unfortunately, we didn't hit a land here. If I did, I could easily blow up Salvala. Two for one myself to kill Salvala it doesn't seem that bad to me, because that card is huge mana ramp. Okay. Yeah, this was the biggest downside to playing the way we did, is we lose out on the card draw from Channeler helping us hit a land. And now this Salvala is just going to get them two mana of any color. I guess it just ramps them up one until they play another creature. But if they play one that's the biggest creature on board, that'll be pretty bad for me. I think I gotta just play Jonathan Harker here so we can do the draw discard thing and keep hitting land drops. Yeah, this is definitely why we're running 18 lands in the deck. Missing a land, even just turn four, feels incredibly painful. Might be another 19 land deck. I think yesterday's deck might have been a deck that should be 19 lands, but... This one's a little quicker than that. I think 18 lands is probably correct for this one. We're just missing on land drops a little bit here. Slightly self-imposed. The better line might have just been to Kologon's command bite the bullet there, except that we're not going to make them discard anything sweet. Um, just so I can Aether Channeler to draw a card later. Unfortunate. They play a three power creature, but it's still big enough to trigger Salvala's card draw. Because the board is just so small. Alright, we did hit a Triome now. That's definitely good. Whenever the legendaries die, they get a 2-2 non-legendary zombie version of it. Interesting. It does not do much here. I guess Savala is legendary. Actually, no, that does matter. I'm gonna draw a discard. Yikes. Still very much looking for more lands. I drop the Dream Eater. Play the Triome then. I was hoping for an untapped land for Outburst. Obviously, did not get there. I just cycle Shark Typhoon to draw a card. Ward two. I need five. I need six mana to blow that up with Ral's Outburst. Okay, there's Incubation Druid. I can blow that up with Kologon's Command. Elena and Elena Partners. Super duper bad for me here. Opponent is getting tremendous value. From Salvala. Salvala's drawn them a card and added a lot of mana here. This is going to be a great Kologon's command at least. Counter Helene and Elena's ability. Kill the Incubation Druid. Problem here is they have almost primarily legends. So if I Rouse Outburst that Helene and Elena, they get a 2-2 zombie version of it, which is just as bad as the main 2-3, so we need to kill Ratadrabic before we can do anything that matters. This is the best I've ever seen Ratadrabic be, but that is because it's in a cube. It's in a cube full of legends. Definitely a lot better than it was in Dominar United Limited. It was a lot harder to get a lot of legends in that format. Well, it looks like Legendary Tribal is very much a thing in this cube, and it's probably going to destroy us. Again, like, I have the interaction, it's just the fact that they just get a duplicate of anything I kill, that's so bad for us. And this is just a huge yikes all around. Just play Prosper and hope for the best. At random.
Ooh, play with fire is a pretty good random. Okay, now it lets me cast it. I don't know why it didn't let me cast it during my end step there. Maybe it did. I just missed out. All right, yeah, make the Rata Drabek ridiculously big. All my burn spells can't kill it. And now Salvala adds a million mana. I think the world in which I just Kologons commanded, the Incubation Druid might, might have been a better world. Or maybe if I just didn't interact with it at all. If I just played the Aether Channel or drew the card, then I'd have the Ralva outburst up by the time they played Salvala. Outbursting Silvala the turn it comes out would have been huge. But obviously I didn't have four mana at that time. So Urtai gets to destroy something. If I kill this Urtai, they get to do it again. There's nothing that much better better for them to kill. So I almost feel like I might as well. Give them a 2-2 two -two Urtai, and now they get to blow up my channeler or something, but I draw a card when they do it. They can kill Harker, I guess. Don't really want to give them the ability to kill Jonathan Harker. I'm going to get my treasure, but I'm just going to shoot the face. I'm getting just rat a all the way out of here. Keeping this land so I have six mana without the treasure to flip Jonathan. They're just gonna cast out Jonathan anyway. Cool. There's a Bolas. Can't afford that if I drop the island. Bolas even help that much. No, because Radadravik has ward. Anything I kill on their board just comes back. This is wild. <laughs> this is not... These are not cards I would have imagined losing to. Radadravik, just because of how bad it was in uh, Dominar United, but it is so good here. Radadravik has been putting in so much work. I'm just going to get really silly here. Our odds of winning this game are tremendously low right now, so I just need to set up to make the most explosive plays imaginable, a possibility. So maybe I get to do something like Nico Bolas make a 7-7 blow up one of their creatures in the future. Because if I don't do something dramatically huge here, things are not going to change. I can't sit here one for one throwing removal at these things because they're getting duplicates of them, so I have to throw th two removal spells at each creature. If I can get to 9 mana, good lord, I was going to say if I can get to 9 mana then I can Bolas the Radadrabic away, but then Bolas dies. But then even if I Bolas Radadrabic away, it's at the point where I don't have the removal for all the other creatures at this point anyway. Would have needed a Wrath effect to get rid of everything. I'm pretty cool with this. Uh, I would have expected an attack all because it doesn't really matter for a tie dies right now since they just get a duplicate. I'm sure, they don't get to blow up another my one of my cards with the duplicate, but it's still I would remove one power from their board total, and I take twelve in the process. So I'm pretty okay with her tie just chilling. One's playing a little passively here, but they can more than afford to. Yeah, I'm just going to leave. We don't have any way to turn this game around. 
Radadrabba Kalena Lena was brutal. Selvala really the engine that fueled it all as well, drawing them an extra card there, and more importantly, giving them a bunch of extra mana. I think we were in a pretty good position if they didn't have Ratadrabic, but every single creature they played was a legend after that, so we just couldn't kill anything without them getting a duplicate, and the ward on Ratadrabic was huge, so we couldn't kill that either. Disgusting card in that deck. Wow, Mono Red Hand. We did look over the mana base in the deck building. We have eight blue and black sources in this deck, so this is potentially a keep. There's a risk. Yeah, eight blue, eight black left in there. We know we can abrade and sark it if I hit any land. This might look kind of dumb and greedy, but I think statistically this is a super fine keep. Worst case scenario, we abrade their first play and sark in the next one and then just start putting a bunch of... Uh, Dragons in our hand. I might just abrade a Mind Stone here to keep them off of ramp. Just Stone Rain abrade over here. We did hit the blue source right on time. Beautiful. Let's just draw a card. Cool. Double black card's not great, but... We are digging farther towards the swamp just by hitting anything off the top. There's a Drowned Catacomb, pretty beautiful. I've got triple blue up for a potential counterspell, not in love with that. Might just play Blood Mage over Sarkin because of that. We definitely go to combat first, give them opportunities to cast removal. No counterspell. Another good value play, now we have a Tybalt late game, so even if Sarkin or Eugene gets countered, Got some cool stuff. There's the key to the archive. So they kept a very similar hand to us. Mono blue, but then into a key to the archive. So now they have uh, they have two mana of any color every turn. Okay. If I play Palladium Mirror this turn, I can cast Tybalt next turn. I mean, Sarkin's not that crazy on an empty board because the most valuable ability that Sarkin has is dealing three damage to a creature. Like, just putting Sarkin down just to conjure a Shivan Dragon in my hand, it's not that great right now until I'm like out of stuff to do, because I'm never going to choose to play a Shivan Dragon instead of an Ugin or a Shivan Dragon instead of a Tybalt. So until I get to the point where I don't have an Ugin and Tybalt in my hand, not that into the, uh, the Sarkin. So farewell off key to the archive. Oh, that's devastating. Yeah, that can add double white. It's not even like, it's like a way better version of the Niv-Mizzet's rock, where it has to be one mana of two different colors with that one. Yep, that, that was pretty good for our opponent, but now we get to Ugin on an empty board. While they're tapped out, then hopefully we can Tybalt next turn. Little well, card draw creatures did a lot of work here. Like, we just got three for one to buy a farewell, but I only have one less card in hand than my opponent anyway. Just thanks to multiple, multiple of my cards drawing a card when they hit the board. Metamorph the key to the archive? All right, to get another card from the mystical archives here. Could be Maelstrom Pulse to destroy Ugin. Could be Wrath of God for when I put too much stuff on the board. Could be literal OG counterspell to try to counter my Tybalt. Could be a Swords to Plowshares to get rid of a creature. A lot of incredibly strong cards in the archive. Could be a Approach of the Second Sun to try to win the game. I think I want to play around them having pulled out a counterspell off of one of these two at least, and just play the Rankle this turn. And they can put Lutri in hand. Seems like they pulled a counterspell. Kindred Denial. Okay. That is worse for us than if they just pulled a counterspell off of the Mystical Archives. But... 
definitely better for us than if we cast Tybalt. That would have been a horrible turn. So that's nice. Got the counter spell out of the way. It's a D spark from the Mystical Archives. So that's only one of the two. Oh, the other is Approach of the Second Sun. They just discarded that already. I just didn't notice. Yep, draft a card from the spellbook, then discard. They chose to draft approach and discard it earlier. Because they were under a lot of pressure. They didn't have time to set up an approach to try to win the game with that. I feel like I still have to play around counter spells here. Especially since they just foretold something that could be a counter spell. Could be Auron's Epiphany, I guess. That would not be great for me. Alright, take that, drop Sarkin, start putting uh Shivan Dragons in hand. Okay, so Saiba Siphoner is going to pick up a Counterspell from their Grave and then cast it. Yes, they're going to pick up Kindred Denial and then cast it. Dang. Lutri would be so busted if it could copy Instance and Sorcery you didn't control. Copy their Kindred Denial and counter their own thing. That would be sick. Alright, Kindred Denial putting in a lot of work here, because every time they counter something with it, they hit a guaranteed non-land card. So they just got two four drops off of their two Kindred Denials. Hopefully all the counter spells in their deck are not four mana. Hole Breaker Horror. Ah oh, no. <gasps> Hole Breaker Horror to miss dismiss? They tap out? I'm into that. I'm so into that. You wouldn't believe how into that I am. Ooh, four damage to their face, tap the Holebreaker and hit for four? That's moderately better than playing a Tybalt. Moderately better than playing a Tybalt. We're going to be one and one as we head into game three. Here we are now for game three. Get a Jonathan Harker turn two to set up my draws. I'm relying on this Jonathan Harker quite a bit, so if my opponent just uh, blows it up the turn I play it, that will be a pretty bad time. We'll see. They have not blown it up yet. So I do get to draw and discard at least one card off of it. Snap doing that. Well, it's not a land, but we are digging closer to a land now thanks to that. Our turn four play is going to be Sarkin. Turn five, multiple choice. Turn 6, Ugin. Turn 7, Nicobolas or Tybalt. Play with Fire is the only card that doesn't actually fit into this curve perfectly. A little awkward. These are my 7 and 8. That's the plan. Yep, Jonathan Harker, let us uh, discard a play with Fire to dig deeper towards the land. Come on, land, 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 land. Let me blow up this Lannery with my Sarkin. Thank goodness. Thank you so much, Jonathan. We needed that little push to get to the Sarkin mana. If you don't respect dragons, then we have a score to settle. I've learned much from dragons. So Sarkin's done just as much work as that play with fire that I exiled would have done, so... Now they probably hit Sarkin, and Sarkin's done more work than the play with fire. So very happy of my choice of discard. Eight. Multiple choice for four. Force them to bounce that. We scry towards a land. There's a land. Draw it. Next turn we're going to play an Ugin.
see what our Rakdos opponent is up to now. Sedgemore Witch has Ward. I dislike that. Wow, and the Feed the Swarm, they don't even have to pay life to because they're killing a uh, token. The Ward is discard a card, isn't it? Oh no, the Ward is pay three life. Okay, that is uh, not nearly as bad of a Ward as I thought it was. I could Ugin shoot the Sedgemore Witch, pay three life. But then they can kill Ugin with Rankle easily. Ugin will be down to one. They could even kill Ugin with the Pest. I'll probably go land, put Lutri in hand, and just Culligan's Command instead then. Pick up Jonathan. Or make my opponent discard a card. This is going to be painful, taking seven here. This wrinkles just the haste here is putting a lot of work. And the Lannery after the Sap Vitality got so much damage in real quick, just hit me for five in one swing. Yeah, this haste stuff has been an issue. Alright, well, we hit our land. I have to pay two life for this land and go to five? I mean, it's for some big plays, isn't it? A two loyalty... Two loyalty Tybalt or three loyalty Nicobolas? We'll go for a three loyalty Nicobolas. Yep. Gods can protect you now. No haste, no haste. No more haste. Please. No burn spell. I'm so scared. Shaking in my boots. If they're out of burn, this is where we stabilize so hard. But just massive planeswalkers. But if they have any more burn, we're just gonna get shot in the face with a fireball. Haste is really bad for us too. Looks like they're checking out the graveyard. They might be reanimating a haster. If they reanimate Lannery, we're dead. Because of the way alchemy cards work, this Lannery is always a three mana five two haste. And of course, good old alchemy perpetually ruining my day. Oh. Okay. Well, opponent gave me hope. They're like, oh, I'll hit Bolas. It's good. No. It is not good. One and two. All right, here we are on the play in game four, which may be the final game for today if it is a loss. Let's hope not. Let's hope we can get there here. I think this deck is pretty sweet. We've just run up against some brutal stuff. Three mana, five, two haste. A little busted. You know, Sap Vitality putting in some major alchemy work. And I'm just going to shoot the uh, Mana Dork again. Slow my opponent down a little bit. Give me some more breathing room. Play a Vizier next turn. Play a Prosper later. Paradise Druid. That I cannot interact with because it has hexproof. Tireless tracker into the landfall trigger for the tracker, and they have a field of the dead too. Yikes. I would enjoy killing that tireless tracker before it gets them any more clues. I'll do that, I think. Hey, Tibble. Welcome to the party. In a while. Hold up the blocker in case they don't need that extra mana this turn. Get to stop two damage to the face instead of dealing one to them. Llanowar Elves is the play. 
And Phyrexian Arena. So they're going to draw an extra card every turn. But they will also lose a life every turn. We're at six mana now. I'm only one mana away from Valky. Prosper feels pretty good here, because if I cast anything off of Prosper, I'll get that treasure token that I can use to cast this Valky. Just kind of chilling with our Vizier still. Vizier gives us the mana we need for a braid if something wild happens that we would need a braid to deal with. They only have five mana on board. They haven't played a land every turn, so even just blowing up a land or elves might be worth using the abrade. Maybe I should have just shot Paradise Druid while they were tapped out. Could see that being a pretty reasonable line. Vivian, Monster's Advocate. Well, looks like I definitely should have killed one of the mana dorks. So Vivian goes to four. There's no way I can hit Vivian for four with two power worth of creatures. Yeah, this is brutal. Um, could get a little funky with it here. And shoot the Paradise Druid and then bounce the Vivian? We gotta play Callous Blood Mage first. Because this is gone forever after this turn. So we'll get the treasure token from this to use that treasure token to cast the Channeler. Unless I draw a land here. Okay, don't draw a land. So now we play the Channeler and we bounce the Vivian. Or actually, I could Vizier for that mana for Channeler. So I don't even need to use the treasure. I can keep the treasure so that I can Tybalt next turn. Yeah, let's do that. Okay, now they have to hit another land to play Vivian again. Like, or I can bounce this beast to kill that and hit Vivian for one, but then Vivian's still out here with three loyalty and just makes another creature next turn. And goes up to four again. This way, if they want Vivian to go up to four again, they have to spend all of their mana to recast her. And that's if they hit a land here. They go land, spend everything, replay Vivian. Okay, land. And spend everything, replay Vivian. Cool with me. Vivian's just going to be sitting at four again. Now they have two three threes. That's fine. Because we're going to have a Tybalt on the board next turn for sure. Every day is a new mutation. One, two, three, four, five. I think I want this untapped. A little bit of pain. Let's me keep a treasure. Actually, just keep both treasures here. By using Vizier. So Fibble Thip. Cast this off these treasures. I get one treasure from Prosper. For casting out of exile. So survive triumphs from Prosper. Just hover over Prosper to see what's from Prosper. Mountain is from Tybalt. So we just keep playing lands and treasure tokens all over the place here and just casting everything in the universe off this Tybalt. That is our game plan. Rankle's definitely a good draw. I don't think they put Reach on either of these. No, they put Vigilance on both. Okay, they gave that one reach. Fair enough. So now Rankle gets blocked by that. 
Tybalt only needs eight to to ultimate. Good lord, Tybalt is dumb. I've never, I don't think I've ever ultimated Tybalt before. I usually just win by like minusing their big threat, such as Captain Sisse. And that is threatening enough to minus that instead of uh, plusing here. How badly will you miss that? Could still play Rankle, but they can uh, block that well. So I like theoretically need to not mill out here. But I know I have a bolos in here somewhere. I think I'm just gonna keep going hog wild. I mean Sisse just gets to tutor for the bolos. Hawksrill, the Corrosive, that can win the game against my board state. Or I guess I'm just casting that against them off this Tybalt. But that's going to kill Fibblethip, Aether Channeler, Callous Blood Mage. They're going to get a bunch of slugs. Beauty lies in variation. This is wild. This stuff is wild. This is, like, not reasonable magic to be had in the Chromatic Cube. Not reasonable whatsoever. Kologon's Command doesn't do much here. There is no ultimate on Vivian, so at least there's that. Yeah, we play this Tox real. And, away you go. and that's better than a Bolas. Four treasures, I get a fifth treasure when I play Blood Crypt. So if I play it untapped, I have seven mana exactly. Three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, we play Bolas as well then. Exile till they had an on land, cast it without paying its mana cost, yes. We'll do that. Free inscription of abundance. What's your struggle? Tart creature you control fights a creature you don't control. That's probably the best one. Kill the Gala Greeters here. I get another treasure off of Prosper. <laughs> We pass the turn, we kill all their slugs and get our own. Nico Bolas needs 12 loyalty to ultimate. I don't know what's going on anymore. I'm just here for the ride. I'm going off the rails. Okay, so they're going to get a 5-drop creature and a 4-drop creature. Do they have a removal spell creature? No. So Toxrel's still chilling. Which means all our planeswalkers are still chilling. Double block the trampler.
All right. More slugs. Slugs everywhere. Cool. Good treasure. Exile something at random from our opponent. You came here with a plan. Hydroid crisis. That's a pretty bad one. That's not ideal. Exile from each player's library. Mirari's Wake's kind of good. That's kind of Gucci. I still don't know what's going on, but I'm going to keep casting spells. Um, that also doubles everybody's power. I'm going to add one to everybody's power. Keep playing from exile for the mana discount. Don't spend the... Okay, good. It did spend the treasure mana. I guess I might as well cast this and just get a treasure. Um, I should be able to Shatter Skull for... X is six or more. Deals twice. X divided as you choose. X divided as you choose. I need five. X needs to be five here. Two targets. Shoot the Tide Mage and Vivian. So six. Yeah, I think I'll shoot these, I guess. Is it what is it, twelve? That's oh, twelve, okay. Sure. I'll survive. It's still uh, pretty unclear what's happening. I'm just going to hit the attack button, I think. How is Hydro Crisis a 1-1? One -one? Oh, I got it off of Tybalt, not Nicol Bolas. I could have cast it for a bunch of X. Okay, my brain is mush after that one. That was, that's too much stuff. Casting everything off of Exile and Prosper's making treasures everywhere, and I'm just, that is, that's quintessential Chromatic Cube. That is, uh, that's just some commander gameplay right there where your brain just glazes over. You're just looking at the board, and then all of a sudden your mind is just completely elsewhere. You're like, oh my god. I feel like I'm operating a Rube Goldberg machine that was designed by a six-year-old child. Made of candy and dreams. All right, here we are in game five now. We're two and two. See if we can get some more wins in here before we get kicked out entirely. Try to get most of our gold back so we can just hop right in and do another one of these bad boys. Shadow Sphere, very happy to see that. Kolagon's Command is going to be the juiciest this game. Two toughness creature. Two toughness creature. Do it, do it. I'm going to command in their end step regardless of what they do here. That's a three toughness creature. You're so rude, opponent. You're so rude. Supposed to play the perfect um, card for me to shoot. So my opponent has the power nine in their deck. I'm pretty sure that's illegal. The black lotus in their deck. That's uh, that's super banned. Okay, I'll we'll just drop a prosper, I guess, while they're tapped out. And uh, fingers crossed, they don't draw a time walk and ancestral recall anytime soon. Cut down, ooh, cut down being exactly enough to kill Prosper. That's pretty brutal. Mole Drifter for the draw two, digging for that power nine. 
play the most powerful nine cards ever printed in Magic against me over here. Not a fan of that. I'm definitely not bouncing that Oracle, though. I just shoot it for three here with Explosion because my only other options are to, like, bounce it right now, which is not good. We just hope they don't have Graveyard Recursion for it because that could end up pretty bad for me. I can only shoot it for one. What am I on about? I forgot how insanely expensive Explosion is. Four mana, then you start adding to X. Okay, well, we play Ornithopter Paradise and then just draw a card off Channeler, I guess. All right, Shatter Skull Smashing will work. That'll kill an Oracle of the Alpha. Oh, there's a Mox. And use the Mox to play Liliana, so they needed the Mox too. Brutal, now everybody sacks two creatures. Um, luckily, Shatter Skull Smashing can shoot Planeswalkers. I can shoot Liliana for two and draw two with Explosion. Or I can save that because the more mana, the better with that one. And just Shatter Skull Smashing Liliana. I think I'd rather save Explosion. Let's just Shatter Skull Liliana. Another one. Liliana number two. Oh, it's and it's way higher loyalty. Uh-oh. That's not great. That's not great for me. That can resurrect the Oracle, can't it? Oh my god, it can. It can put the Oracle back onto their battlefield and shuffle a second copy of the Power Nine into their deck. Oh lord. Yep. I will win yeah, that, that's to be expected. That is the funnest play. That is the funnest play available to my opponent. Do I not have double red? Blue, blue, red, red. I absolutely do. The others can deal with you. All right, well, we got both the Lilianas out of here, but our opponent now has two copies of the Power Nine in their deck. There's the Braids. Jacob Hawken. We know him well. Sack creature, so we lose two life and they draw a card. I, yet again, really don't want to bounce any of their cards with multiple Troys. Just play a Vizier of Tumbling Sands into Rankle and make each player sack a creature, and they sack grades, Braids, preferably. And I just sack Vizier? Actually, no, I could just I could play Blood Mage if that's, the, if that's the line. Rankle Blood Mage here. Hmm. One issue. If I play Vizier, attack with Rankle, and then they sack the Oracle, then I'd really want to exile their grave with Blood Mage the turn after that happens. Blood Mage's ability to exile the grave is, act the grave is actually really tempting here. And Vizier is not that valuable, so I'm just going to sack Vizier. Because the other thing about their graveyard is that um, one of the pieces of the Power Nine is Time Twister, which shuffles the whole graveyard back into the library. So I really want a Blood Mage Grave. Hopefully they don't have the Time Twister just yet. I can exile the grave and then they can't... Uh-oh. All right, extra turn. Fingers crossed again. No Time Twister, please. No Time Twister. They have two time walks in their deck too. This is so dumb. 
There's so many darts we have to avoid here. So many knives we have to dodge. Duplicate braids. Does that mean I'm just dead? Not quite. But I don't see how I survive next turn. Oh, yeah, they can sack two artifacts and I can't sack something to stop that. Still not quite dead. Um, but yeah, I don't think I survive this turn. Good gravy. Um, I do have eight mana, so I can put Lutri in hand and then double a braid. But I, I don't have the time to Blood Mage their graveyard now and survive. They put so many Power Nine in their deck, they have 37 cards still. <laughs> All right, well... We're just going to get absolutely demolished for our last game. So be it, it's a cool way to die. Oh my god, just choose the cost I can afford, Arena. Why would you make me... Oh, it's blue, red, and one. That's so whack. There. I guess it's because I'm in full control. I went full control so I knew I could get Lushry down before the Abrade resolves. Alright, now Rankle has to block this 1-1, one -one, so they need to not have removal. Alright, Mox Emerald. Reasonable. Reasonable. Please don't draw something sick off the top of my library. We don't get to know what they drew until they cast it against us. Sarkin, that's lethal. Kills Rankle, they hit me for one with a bird. Brutal. At least we didn't get time walked. We didn't get the, the original time walk cast on us. They had to cast the full All Runes Epiphany. Uh, but that deck was obnoxious. Oracle of the Alpha just seems like a card that is way too easy to abuse. That is going to be a busted card in every cube deck, in every cube, not even just Chromatic Cube. If it were in the regular cube, it would be absurd. Just draft a little bit of um, bounce spells, any flicker, which definitely exists in this cube. It's a reanimation. Nasty card there. We didn't even really have to face up against their power nine cards, really. They just played a bunch of moxes, which was good, but um, didn't have to run up against the, the recalls and the time walks and stuff, luckily. But still some busted stuff from some Lilianas and all that. So, brutal games today. Two and three is not ideal, not where I would have wanted to be for this deck. Um, some of the issues, we were a little top-heavy. Our opponents could just get so much stuff off on the board before we could really do all of the interaction that we wanted to. Um, yeah, I mean, we missed a few land drops, hit a few lands trying to get to some big spells. So, and the biggest thing is, like, not having a Wrath in this deck is pretty brutal, but there's very few Wraths in this cube. They tried to go for kind of a low, low board wipe cube. There's, like, one... Um, there's the big worm, but that's only minus two, minus two. The massacre worm and the meat hook massacre got nerfed, so it doesn't give you the life gain anymore. But I don't think we saw either of those that we could have put in this deck. Overall, still some cool stuff. When when the deck worked, it went absolutely explosively. I mean, we got that game where we had Bolas, Tybalt, and Prosper down, which was just the dumbest thing ever. Incredibly rough to uh, to do the math there on, on all that stuff. Really liked the Vizier, or the, the Channeler and the Blood Mage. Those were super sweet. Um, drawing cards while still getting cards onto the board to be trading with. It's pretty good against our opponent's Wrath there. Um, I would say Vizier and Palladium Mirror were some of the biggest underperformers. Overall, Palladium Mirror only ever died. Um, and then Vizier just felt a little slow. So if these were swapped out for just more Kologons, Command style, really good instant speed interaction at 3 and 4 mana. I think our deck would be about as good as it can get. So, still think this deck was a little better than a 2-3 on average, but you're not always going to get a great run with it. Sometimes you'll get the uh, the lower average win rate out of your deck, which is what I think happened today. So, 2 and 3 out of it, 
not bad at all. We got to play some bow losses, got to play some Tibbles. That's what we were wanting to do. But uh, that is going to end today's video. As always, if you enjoyed this video and you'd like to see more, you can like, comment, and subscribe to let the YouTube algorithm know to send you some more. And uh, yeah, as always, thank you very much for watching. And I'll see you again soon for some more Magic Arena.